Hey, beautiful soul. Welcome to Spirit Speakeasy. I'm Joy Giovanni, joyful medium. I'm a working psychic medium, energy healer, and spiritual gifts mentor. This podcast is like a seat at the table in a secret club, but with mediums, mystics, and the spiritual luminaries of our time. So come behind the velvet ropes with me and see inside my world as I chat insider style with profoundly gifted souls. We go deep, share juicy stories, laugh a lot, and it wouldn't be a speakeasy without great insider secrets and tips. You might even learn that you have some gifts of your own. So step inside the spirit speakeasy. Hey, beautiful souls. In this episode, we have Mark Lanehart, the intuitive prospector. He is not only a medium and a psychic and a minister and a talk show host, a podcast, radio show, a writer. He does so many things. But in this episode, he really generously shares with us not only about his own gifts as a medium, but also these two really profound near-death experiences that he has in his own life. And one is actually the same year that both of his brothers pass away in completely unrelated occurrences, I guess is the best way to say it. He really goes deep with us and shares how profound this grief was for him, how he processed it, how he came to find meditation and his own spiritual gifts, but he really lets me ask him some questions about these near-death experiences, um, maybe in a way that he hasn't shared before, just a little more in-depth detail. Um, Of course, you guys know I always have questions, so especially when we're talking about the near-death experience when he's only five and the light beings that he encountered and his experience with them, you know that I had more questions about that. So we really get into it. And like I said, he's so generous with these personal traumas and tragedies and experiences and sharing with us so many gems of wisdom along the way about how to tune into our own gifts, how to best find that path, how to really let yourself have permission to be on a journey of personal evolution with these gifts, how they might show up, how they might not show up, and really what to do in between. So I know that you're going to love this conversation with Mark Lanehart, the intuitive prospector. Here it is. Hey, beautiful souls. I'm Joy Giovanni, and this is Spirit Speakeasy. I am so excited to have this guest with us today. His name is Mark Lanehart, and I'm going to read you his bio so we can dive into this conversation. He is a spiritual consultant on life, loss, and love. Based in Seattle, Washington, Minister Mark Lanehart is an award-winning British-trained psychic and spiritual medium and a best-selling author. Uh, He is Best American Psychic 2020 Psychic of the Year, Mark's work as a radio show host, hiking guide, metaphysical teacher, inspirational thought leader, certified healthcare provider, and writer, striving to help inspire, guide, teach, transform others in connecting to spirit, to self, and to the wonderful world around us. With his near-death experience, out-of-body experience, and several personal tragedies along the way, Mark has spent the last two decades deciphering and demystifying the sensational subject matter of death and dying, and now endeavors to help others from all around the world to tap into and flex their intuitive muscles and abilities with a deeper understanding and awareness of what he calls ADCs, which is after-death communications and interactions with the mystical universe and the unseen. You can find him at marklanehart.com or internet search Mark Lanehart, the intuitive prospector. And of course, we will have all of that linked in the show notes, but please give a warm welcome to Mark Lanehart. It's great to have you. Welcome. Hi, Joy. Thanks for having me on. So excited to have you here. Now, you have given me free reign to really dive in and ask you some tough questions. So I just want to let everyone know that up front so we don't get a bunch of emails asking why I asked you so many hard <laughs> questions. But you really do openly share about 
your near-death experiences. So I would love if you would share a bit of that with us and, and tell us about your gifts and, and how those two connect if they do. You bet. Well, thanks again for having me on. Congratulations on your show. Thanks. And yeah, I always like to say, um, let's go prospecting. And what I mean by that is a prospector, we go out and we're searching for what's right for us on our journey, whether it's spiritual or non-spiritual. And so years ago, when before I even became the intuitive prospector, because I didn't, I wasn't really going to do this work. I had no plan, no idea that I would even be going down this path. Uh, when I was um, 27, I had uh, an, my second near-death experience. So I've actually had two near-death near experience and an OBA, OBE, which is an out-of-body experience. So NDE is near-death experience. OBE is out-of-body experience. And some of your listeners have probably had one or both or either or. So years ago when I was five, a very adventurous child, I'd fallen out of a tree and landed about 20 feet on my face and oh, wow. had gone into a coma. And I was in a coma for almost three days. It's, uh, it's really the only time I've ever been in the hospital, like stayed overnight in a hospital. And it was during that time that I walked with, at the time, what I called shadow people. And nothing to be, nothing nefarious, nothing scary. There were just two beings that were really tall and didn't have, uh, they weren't male, they weren't female. And they walked me around. They were holding my hands and they were showing me things. Wow. And so when I came out of the coma, uh, they had, I, I guess at some point there was some, you know, they weren't sure if I was going to make it. And I was excited because I was talking about the shadow people. I was walking around getting this whole tour. And so that was my first experience with the uh, the spiritual side, the paranormal, the, um, the the other side, you know, whatever your definition is, the, the afterlife, Summerland. And then it was years later uh, here in, I'm here in the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Washington. We were on a, a doing a river um, adventure on the Yakima River here. And not paying attention, young, 27, and we got into a log jam. So we had to actually push the raft away so the other people on that raft wouldn't get in the log jam. And if you've ever been on a river, that's the one thing you don't want to do is go into a log jam. Very dangerous. And so long story short, uh, pushed the raft away. Uh, my wife and myself and my uh, best friend at the time, Yancey, um, all went into the log jam. I pushed my wife to the side and I went in and so she could, you know, be saved. And it was in, it was in there that I got pinned underwater and it was about four oh, no. feet of water that I could see the river running over. And I was just pinned with the current. It was really strong current that day. And I just thought to myself, how ironic, cause growing up, my nickname was fish. Cause I loved water. I'm a swimmer. Um, did I spend a lot of time in the water and I thought how ironic is I'm going to drown in the river. And uh, you know, it's, if it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And I accepted that. And it was just this piece that came. There wasn't any white light at the end of the tunnel. There wasn't, um, you know, uh, whatever religious belief. For me, it would be Jesus. I've always always taught that Jesus would be waiting for you. And I didn't have any of that experience. What I did have was this peace and love that just embraced me. And as I started to ascend, and that's where we use the term ascension, because we have this this um, this motion of ascending from our body and looking back down. A lot of people have described it, and that's what I was starting to have. And I didn't really want to come back, if I'm being honest. It was such love and joy and peace that I was like, let's go. This is, you know, and, and then all of a sudden, I just shot right back down into my body and popped up. So, wow. you know, I've asked, uh, you know, through different counseling, through different experts, through different mentors, they, they all tell me the same thing. Well, Mark, you had more work to do here. So, you wow. know, that's my, uh, my two near-death ex experiences. And it was, um, you know, even brief, but just powerful. And it was life-changing to me. I have so many questions. <laughs> Anyone who knows me is not surprised. Um, so when we go back and look at your near-death experience when you were five, how long were you in a coma at that time? Uh, from what I've been told, it was about three days. Is okay. I, I don't remember. The last thing I remember, I, I was, you know, not being, you know, a smart five-year-old. I was on this branch riding it like a horse, and the branch decided to break. And that's the last thing I remember. I have no... Um, memory of actually falling or even hitting. I don't remember the pain. I don't remember the injuries. Um, but what I do remember is walking with those very tall beings that were, I don't, I don't know if shadow is the right word. When people, when I say the word shadow, people then kind of get this like dark, mysterious. Yeah, it's a and connotation, it was, I think, yeah, assigned by media. Yeah, and it wasn't. I would say light beings because they were holding my hands and they were being very, um, you know, uh, like tourists, I was a tourist and they were showing me around and they were, and it was just joy. I wasn't scared at all. So, and then um, so I came out of the coma about three days later. Yeah. So when you were experiencing them, like you said, holding your hands and beside you and, and giving you the tour, do you have any recollection of 
anything you were experiencing in that place that you were, if it was, even was a place, I guess. Yeah, it's, um, I would describe it because I had to really go back through some counseling and hypnotherapy to try to, because when you're, you know, the memory of a five-year-old is not very detailed. But as I've uh, gone back into meditations and hypnotherapy and, and past life, those types of sessions, I've been able to recall. And it's it's almost like the world that I was walking in kind of had a, uh, like on a hot day, that mirage, that heat, kind of that waviness. That's mm -hmm. how I describe it. It was, it, was a, it was a real place like this, but it just had like this dreamy state and everything was kind of like almost like you could see the colors of the rainbow and you could see and you could feel the energy that was all around you is how I would best describe that. It's really hard to That's describe. That's such a great description. Well, yeah, right? Yeah. We're describing these otherworldly things in our own finite human understanding. Right, so, right. Did, were there like trees and things of nature or was it just this? Like, no, it was, yeah, it was just like here. There was trees. The, I would say the biggest difference, it was like walking in the rainbow because here in the physical world, in the, uh, what we call the incarnate world, you know, we don't see a lot of the, the colors of the rainbow, but we know those colors are always around us. It's only when the light is refracted or you're at 30,000 feet looking down through a cloud and you see those actual seven colors of the rainbow. I would describe what I was seeing at that time, a world filled with those rainbow colors, just magnificent colors that we don't see here with the physical eye. And so I always remind people, just because you don't see a rainbow doesn't mean it's not there. It's there. It's just oh, how it's Oh, it's a great refracted. way to say it. Yeah. yeah. And so. did you, in your retrospective work and your healing work that you did, you know, in the many years following, yeah. did you get any clarity about who these light beings were? Were they guides? Were they angels? Do you not know? Obviously they're benevolent. Yeah, um, it's it, there's been a couple. It's been the guides, my the ascended masters that are looking over to kind of you know guide me here on the physical plane, uh, and then a, a, an angel. So those are the two feedbacks: ascended masters and angel. When I've gone into meditation or I've sat um, with uh, like hypnotherapy, that is the information that's come back to me. I just remember they were really tall and they were very gentle and nice and loving. So you know, your that's ascended amazing. masters and angels can be all of that, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I just was curious about the, you know, in our human understanding, I think often we're trying to categorize these beings mm -hmm. into like, mm -hmm. these are your guides. This is a religious figure or an ascended master. This is an angel. But I, mm -hmm. I don't even know if it entirely works that way. I do think it's a lot of our human sorting I, to try to make more sense of it. Yeah, I think we try to put a label on trying to define because that's the human ego, right? That's the curiosity right. of us as humans. And I would say, uh, you know, it's almost hard to explain, try to fit that into a label. It could be whatever we want it to be, or it could be was what, what is needed at the time as a five-year-old. So I wasn't scared. So, you know, I think it can just be omni and present as far as it could be the ascended masters, the angels all in one, or a family member, a loved one that's already passed on ahead of me that was, you know, thought, oh, Mark's crossing over. Let's go welcome him, you know, after falling 20 feet on your face. Um, let's welcome him so he's not scared. And, um, yeah, I would. I, I wouldn't try to, to define what it is. I'm just. I know that there's a presence of life after death. Is is a consciousness, an energy, a love that does survive um, after we um, go into a you know medical coma or you know near death experience or death itself. I think you make a really great point for people to remember. No matter how versed they are in you know the world of mediumship, but. Mm -hmm we don't necessarily have to have a definition of, okay, this is your spirit guide. They do X, Y, Z. They mm -hmm. used to be X, Y, Z. We don't, we don't need that to receive the love, the guidance, right. the compassion that we need. Right. I love that. Right. And I think sometimes we block ourselves from receiving that when we try to define it or label it, you know, when I'm working with my students or my clients, I remind them, you know, our definition of heaven is up. And, you know, I was I was raised in Catholicism and I was always taught that if you're good enough, you would go up to heaven. And if you weren't good enough or you were really bad, you go down to hell. And if you didn't meet any of those standards and you stayed around here in purgatory, but they don't teach that anymore as purgatory. But I always remind people that there is no up or down metaphysically right. because we live on a round planet going around a big ball of fire. So you can't go up or you can't go down. But when we have that leaving our body experience, like I did with my near death experience, that ascension we just think up is always this way. But if I go up, there is no heaven because you can't go up. We're on a round planet in space. So yeah, you make deep, such a good, I mean, deep, there's so many, thoughts. so many things to think about in there, which I yeah. love. 
uh, before we leave this little experience, I'm just curious, uh, you have me thinking about so many things, but <laughs> did, did these beings, these guides, whoever they were, when it was time for you to transition back into your five-year-old life, do you just remember them drifting away? Did they speak to you? Was there any, you know, how did that transition happen back into, oh, hi, I'm here again and I'm at the hospital or wherever you were? Yeah, it was actually quite an adjustment because I kind of shot back. I kind of just woke right up. And then, of course, as soon as I woke up, I got sick and I was embarrassed about getting sick. I threw up over the side of the bed and everybody was everybody was at the st standing at the foot of my bed looking at me. And I felt kind of angry, like, why is everybody staring at me? Because I didn't know that I'd been in a coma for three days wow. and then got embarrassed because I got sick. So I knew I was back in the physical world. But that just, you know, there, there was no word spoken. It's very similar to when you have a dream. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but with my dreams, they never speak to me like you and I are speaking, which is a vibration off a vocal cord. It's more of just a, te a telepathy, a sense of knowing, like you're having your communications up here in your mind without the words. That's how I would describe how they were communicating to me without words. What's so interesting, um, just from like the human medium perspective, I don't really share this with people. So I don't know if I've ever told this story outside of close friends before, but I actually had an experience with beings very much like what you're describing when I was mm -hmm. somewhere between like seven and 10 and I was really ill. I was at home, but I was in and out of consciousness. And uh, the way my mom would tell the story is, yeah, you were hallucinating and talking to yourself, but I very clearly remember a very tall, there were three of them. One was very, very tall, like you described, mm -hmm. which is so interesting because I've never heard anyone describe it like that before. Maybe I just haven't been listening, but <laughs> so, so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, they so, were they were definitely taller than me, but I wasn't very tall at five years of well, age. Well, so. <laughs> I guess, I guess not. <laughs> so after that experience and your adjustment period, of course, you're five, so you're just a little guy. Is there any recollection for you of starting to have more of like, quote unquote, the spiritual gifts in the waking state, or does that not come for you till much later? I, I, to answer your question, I think it's a combination of both. I think for me as a five-year-old, um, you don't really know, you can't define, you know, spiritualism, you know, right, you're, just, you're learning the ways of the world, right? It wasn't until years later that I reflected back through hypnotherapy and biofeedback, two very important parts of transformation and healing and honoring your, 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 um, your grief and the things that you go through. And, and when I first went through biofeedback, I remember back to that five-year-old child and uh, same with hypnotherapy. And what was interesting about that is I was five years old when Star Wars came out, 1977. And if you look behind me, there's a poster. That's the original Star Wars poster from the movie theaters. I have all three of them. And I think for me, that curiosity of locking into the force, right? I know it's a movie. It's Hollywood. But there's a reason that it generates billions of dollars almost, you know, 45 years later because people resonate with the living force, the force that binds us and connects us. I'm throwing a Star Wars plug in here. But from that time on, I'd always been fascinated. I went to Star Wars in the movie theater 23 times with my wow. uh, with my relatives and my friends because I was just fascinated with the uh, the concept of in a galaxy far, far away. And I think that is directly related to my first experience, not knowing it was spiritual. But if you look at the deeper, if you go deeper with the, even just the writings of Star Wars, it's very, very spiritual concepts. Oh, yeah, right. You know, meditations uh, put into a Hollywood movie, but the concepts go back thousands of years that George Lucas was very brilliant and made a lot of money off of. So I think that was my first experience of really realizing the spiritual. But as most children do, we tuck that away based on our learning environment, um, you know, our, our, uh, our peers, our education system. And so I think a lot of the abilities that I had early on as a child were actually, you know, laid dormant. And it wasn't until years later after, you know, I, I had my near death experiences, but I also went through some great trauma and tragedy, what I call today the TNT that blew my life up. I tell people that I actually went to college to learn how to meditate and actually to go down the path of spiritualism and mediumship and psychic and intuition. And people are like, wait, you went to college? And I'm like, yeah, I went to college and I didn't plan to go down this path. So to answer your question, I think, yes, early on, just didn't know until later in life as I reflected and recalled it, how it all tied together. Well, I think you bring up a really great point again for so many people to know, because a lot of us, I think, because of the wonderful world of media, think that mm -hmm. these gifts come in always as a really big, powerful experience or that we're always you know, the kid who sees dead people or, mm -hmm. and it's, it's wonderful that you have the experience that it wasn't exactly like that for you, that 
you know, mm -hmm. you can see things in, in retrospect now, but that at the time you didn't recognize all of these sensitivities yeah. you had. And going into that second near-death experience, I mean, that's a really powerful near-death experience because you do remember how it happened differently mm -hmm. than your mm -hmm. earlier one. And it, water, I think, can be really scary, even if you are a fish <laughs> and mm -hmm. spend a lot of time in it. When you were in that transitional space, how you were talking about that sensation of ascending and then that feeling of getting sucked back in, was there any type of conscious choice or understanding or was it really just a feeling of, okay, now I'm moving this direction and now I'm jolting back? This direction. Yeah, it was that jolting back. I, I don't think I, I don't believe I had a choice in it, uh, which is interesting because we always talk about free will and choice with the work that we do. And, and um, yeah. you know, our greatest responsibility is free will and choice. But I don't feel at that time when I shot back down into my body because I was ready to go. It's almost like I was looking back, kind of waving back at myself saying, you know, uh, you know, ciao, I'm, I'm on my way to the next adventure. And all of a sudden it just pulled me right back in. It just shot me right back in. And a lot of people describe it that way. And it, I don't recall saying, I want to go back. I don't recall saying, oh, I'm not done yet. I, I have more work to do. It was almost like, we can talk about destiny. We can talk about, you know, God, but it was like, there was something that said, okay, no, you're not, you're not ready yet. I'm going to send you back. And, you know, like I said, there was more work to do. And, and, and I see it now for what it is because the work that I do, uh, it's beneficial to people to share these stories and to write about this and to podcast about this and people can relate to that and to realize that death isn't something to be scared of. You know, you, you read my bio and then I try to demystify death and dying, you know, and just as John Lennon reminded us, you know, he talked about he didn't believe in death because he felt like it was getting out of one car and getting into another car. And that's how I, I look at it the same way. It's just, we have all these different cars that we're going to get in and out of on the journey of life. And, yeah, so I, I think for me, um, it was a, a higher source, a higher consciousness. You know what, you know whatever your definition of God is, because everybody has different beliefs and different definitions right. and perspectives. But I've learned in my spiritual pathway, the art of spiritualism is the ability to uh, shift your perspective. And so there's something that's greater than myself uh, that said, no, you got to go back. Wow, that's a really powerful experience, and it's it's so great that you're able to share it. And I'm sure it's taken you a lot of work to get to that point. A lot of work, now, a lot of transformation and healing. I always, you know, remind your listeners, it just doesn't come overnight. In fact, I had a quote that I pulled up because it, sh it should resonate with your listeners. We delight in the beauty of the butterfly, but we rarely admit the changes it has gone through to achieve that beauty. And that's Dr. Maya Angelou who Angelo, talked about yeah. that. And we don't get from the caterpillar to the butterfly without the cocoon phase, right? And we've got to do the self-work. We've got to go through that cocoon to emerge as the butterfly. That's actually one of my favorite quotes. And, and even oh, just to build on that, it's no one can help us because it is nope. in that squeezing ourselves out of the cocoon that, you know, air is breathed into us essentially. And that new mm -hmm. version of our life can start to I don't, emerge, I guess. Um, now you alluded a little bit to that TNT that blew up your life. And I'd love to talk a little bit about that because I do feel like it's such a powerful part of your story because none of us are exempt from the human experience, from the things that just happen, quote unquote, the things that maybe aren't destined or that aren't pre-planned, that just through no necessary cause, you know, sometimes things just happen that we have mm -hmm. to deal with in our lives. And I think that's a lot of what happened to you in that pivotal 27th year where this near death experience happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a tough year, <laughs> you know, an, an NDE and then, uh, you know, to go through uh, watching both your brothers. So there's three brothers uh, in my family, uh, my older brother, Todd, my younger brother, Michael. And within one week, uh, my brother was murdered on a Sunday. And then three days later, my older brother was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and then moved into the spirit world. And that's the TNT. Now, that's just my side of the house. My wife was losing her dad at the time to MS, multiple sclerosis, a horrible oh. disease. All of it, cancer, multiple sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's, they're all horrible diseases to watch your family members go through. And so those three events that were happening simultaneously, along with my near-death experience, really started you know, having me rethink and see the world differently. And so 
you know, I, I remind people that, you know, the TNT, when it blows your life up, a breakdown leads to a breakthrough. It, you know, you have, you know, your greatest power is how you respond to life. And life for me is an acronym. Learn it from experience, right? So I have a lot of experience when it comes to, you know, grieving, when it comes to healing, when it comes to transformation, when it comes to psychic, when it comes to mediumship. And it's because I've gone through all of that stuff and I can empathize at a greater depth than some people that haven't gone through, um, you know, death and dying or grieving, you know, and it's, it's important to honor your grief. And, you know, I'll, I'll ask this question to you and your listeners as my headset is falling off, as the sun is coming in, uh, you know, what is the difference between grieving and mourning? And the answer is grief is something that's internal to you specifically. So when you've lost a loved one, your grief and how you grieve is going to be private, intimate to you. Mourning is how you express that grief. And so mourning can come in, you know, when that night was happening, because I literally went from my, my brother's funeral, I literally loaded up Michael in the hearse to drive out to the valley to be told that my older brother was going to pass uh, from brain cancer. Same night. I, I wow. wish I could make that up, but I'm not. A, it's just horrible. And so I had a few um, conversations with God and, and it, you know, what I, you know, envisioned God to be. And it wasn't a very polite conversation. It was quite angry and quite. And so that's, you know, your, your mourning can be different forms. It can be anger. It can be dance. It can be celebration. It can be, um, you know, what I'm doing now is literally honoring my grief through the power of mourning, through my podcast, through my, um, my articles, through the, the clients that I help. And I see here in Seattle, in my studio or online. So I didn't realize it at the time. If you would have said 20 years later that, Hey, Mark, you'd be doing this work. I would have just looked at you like, what are you even talking about? That doesn't even make, you know, logical sense to me. So you know, it's important to honor your grief and you do that through the power of mourning. And so I always remind, you know, people to do the things that your loved ones love to do in life. Um, you know, celebrate them, celebrate today because, you know, we forget about, you know, yesterday is history. Tomorrow's a mystery. Today is the gift. That's why we call it the present and to carp them. People forget that because they project out to a future that's not guaranteed. So, you know, live for today. Celebrate your loved ones by doing the things or eating the food or watching the movies that they loved, and that can help you feel closer to your loved ones until you see them again because they're not gone. They just got in the car ahead of you, and they'll see you down the road. That's so true, and I love that distinction between grief and mourning because truly, you know, a version of mourning may be going on for the rest of, of your natural life with your situations or, you know, right. anyone with their own situations and it can change and shift and show up as different emotions in different times and it's how we move through that or choose not to or you know continue mm -hmm. forward or don't and with such a profound amount of loss in a 24-hour period for you I can imagine that you know laying to rest your first brother I would imagine that you're in such a state of grief and right in the midst of that trauma because it was a traumatic passing mm -hmm. to then yep. hear news of your other brother, I would imagine that you're not even fully available to process all of it at once. Is that right for you? Yeah, that's very true. In fact, when I started to seek out some grieving counseling and, and start that, that journey of healing and transformation and that inner work, the dark work, if you will, um, I had an actual counselor tell me when you have a family member that's been murdered, you're already pegged at 100% stressed out. Now, that's just the murder itself. That's not including all the detectives that were at the funeral. That's not including the media coverage. We actually had to release a statement as a family because of the murder and the media was, you know. So all of a sudden you're thrust into this spotlight of media and news people asking you questions and you're still trying to process. And then you just do the domino effect of, well, I just buried my brother surrounded by detectives that were watching everybody in the funeral because they don't, we didn't have a suspect at the time um, or suspects it ended up being five people involved later down, you know, a few months later wow. and, and then going out and, and having a, a surgeon sit down and say, well, you know, we got the, the tumor out. It's called glioblastiotoma. It was on his left temple right here for my older brother. We got it out, but it already spread microscopically and he only has a few months to live. And, you know, to process you're like, wait, I'm still processing for my, my brother that I just loaded up. And now you're telling me, now my older brother's going to die. So it was almost, um, you know, it's like everything slowed down. We talk about 
time and it, everything. It was like the surgeon was telling me, but he sounded like the the parents from the the Peanuts cartoon. It was just like yeah. roar, everything was slow motion. And I just remember standing up and walking out into the hall and just screaming because that's all I could do. I just, you know, I didn't know how to process everything. And um, I look back at that and that, that's the, the trajectory that changed my life to get me to start studying, to start learning, start developing uh, these abilities and to talk about death and dying without being scared of it. I respect the heck out of it, but I do not fear death because it, it, there's proof of life after death. And so I'm looking forward to that next soul adventure. For anyone... That's really profound the way that you can explain it now. <laughs> I know that so much, you know, hard work and sweat mm -hmm. and tears, mm -hmm. and I'm sure lots of additional screaming to some degree went into all of that. For someone that's on maybe the, f the first beginning phases of that journey of grief and making sense of all of it, mm -hmm. what advice would you give for someone that's lived through this dramatic of a, you know, multiple tragedy situation? That's a really good question. Be patient. I, you know, two of the foundations I teach on is trust and patience. And I would say, you know, to embrace your authentic self, who you truly are. A lot of people, you know, especially in today with social media and, and uh, you know, how people present themselves, I would say to your listeners, you know, embrace who you truly are. And the only way to truly understand who you are, you know, they always say, uh, the journey is within to go within, uh, you're not going to receive the answers out here. You can get them, you know, a hundred different psychics telling you a hundred different answers, but the the work really begins with the journey of self or as uh, I believe it was last that talked about, you know, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, but you know, trust the process, be patient with the process. This is 20 years of me talking about this, like, in a you know, an hour show, but it's 20 years in the making with all the different right. experiences and education. And I would tell people, you know, your listeners as well, it's okay. I use the acronym FAIL, first attempt in learning. Fail often, fail daily, because that's why you're here. It's nothing to, to be afraid of. And go out and, you know, my tagline is dare to dream, dare to explore, dare to live and discover that diamond within, because we all have that diamond. The question is, are we willing to prospect to go within to find that diamond? Because if there's no pressure there's no diamond. We know that diamonds are created under extreme pressures, right? And we know that diamonds live in darkness and you can remain a, a lump of coal if you want, but if you want to really start prospecting and go within, eventually that diamond is going to emerge into the light and be shared with all of its value and all of its sparkle with those that seek you out. And that's a lot of my work today, including my podcast. So. Well, and it's so beautiful that you have been able to really live through all of this to step into your mediumship, step into mm -hmm. your spiritual gifts, but just like anyone has the ability to come to this understanding that there is more than this, that really we do get to experience our loved ones again, that they still are around us and do know what's going on with us. They care about what's going on in our, our day-to-day lives, mm -hmm. but I'm sure as you were saying, 20 years of processing. I know you didn't get to it, especially with your brothers right away. Would you share a little bit of how that journey went for you from, you know, after all of this happens, how do you start moving forward? Like you said, it's small steps and failing greatly. Mm -hmm. What was your trajectory? What was your process? What did you try that, you know, you feel like might help others? Yeah. So, you know, I just share my experiences to help others because you can't make somebody hear a reading or you can't make somebody hear a message until they're ready, right? When the student is ready, the teacher appears. And so for me, after, you know, we buried my brothers and my father-in-law, I really started to ask a lot of these deeper questions of, you know, I, I live with survivor's guilt. That's a real thing. And, uh, you know, I tell people, you know, I was the last of the brothers. And for years, both my brothers passed away in January. I would, I would not look forward to January. And it wasn't until a few years ago that one of my mentors that we both know uh, had suggested that I take the month of December off just to do nothing, no readings, no, no podcast, nothing. And I, when I did that, I, I came in ready to embrace January and also acknowledge, you know, that there was survivor's guilt and PTSD. These are all mental health things that go with this work. 
But I'd say for your listeners, as I started to ask these questions, I started, we have the internet, we have technology at our, our fingertips. I can't imagine what somebody would go through, you know, let's say 60, 70, 100 years ago, because you'd have to go to the library and get a book, I guess, you know, one of these books back here. Um, but I really started to look at the different things because I come from a very logical uh reasonable, reasonable mindset because I, my career was in fire service as a firefighter, EMT, um, U.S. Coast Guard. So I was in the role of emergency medicine and life saving. So I didn't really have a mindset to start switching from left analytical brain to this right brain of spiritualism. So I started off uh, the first place that I went to, I just got online and I just literally started looking and prospecting uh, for all these different things. What is intuition? What is a psychic? What does the word psychic mean? What is mediumship? Uh, it was about that time that, uh, you remember the movie that came out, the, the Sixth Sense with the little boy that would yeah. see. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I'm not seeing that. I'm not having that experience. But, you know, start to explore and to prospect. And eventually that energy, that like attracts like, what you put out will start to come back to you. So now we're going to flip to metaphysics and energy because your vibration, everything starts with a thought, thoughts become words, words become vibrations. And so when you ask, believe, receive, and perceive, you start this ripple effect that'll take you. It took me from the Berkeley Psychic Institute down in California to the Omega Institute in upstate New York, where I first met Janet Nohavik and John Holland. And Janet said, you need to go to this college in England, the Arthur Finley College. And I'm thinking, what is going on? Why am, why am I going to all these places? And then that eventually led me to you know, study for the last decade at the uh, Arthur Finley College and understand the depth of psychic healing mediumship. And going back, it was when I was in uh, finishing my graduate studies here at the University of Washington in sports medicine and human performance. Now, this is interesting. This is very key to all this. My professor was in a car accident, and so she was replaced from a professor that had come up from Stanford. And the course was visualizations, meditations, and manifestations for the professional athlete. Had nothing to do with spiritualism. But the professor had a background in spiritualism. He just couldn't say that because of the course curriculum at the university. So we did this whole quarter. I did this whole variations of different meditation, mind meditation, breath meditation, walking meditation, tension release meditation. And wouldn't you know it, <clears throat> that door that had remained dormant when I talked about when I was five years old, that door reopened. And all of a sudden, wow. I'm having conversations with both my brothers and my father-in-law. And now rationally and logically, I'm thinking, yeah, Mark, you've gone crazy. But crazy people can't di diagnose themselves. You don't know that you've gone crazy, right? So that's what really led me to start looking at all this stuff because I was having conversations. I could hear their voices. I could feel them. I knew that they were around me, but I couldn't see them here. So for your listeners, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not here. We have three eyes in life. Two to look, one to see. We could spend a whole nother topic on the pineal gland and the the, oh, for the, sure. the third <laughs> eye, why we call it the third eye, the makeup of the third eye, right? But that's a big part of spiritualism is when this eye starts to open, because we call it the third eye because it has the same makeup as our two physical eyes. And when you start to open that eye, there's a lot of self-analyzation, a lot of critique, a lot of self-sabotage. So be patient with yourself. Have trust for the process. Let the process unfold, just like you can't make a flower bloom before it's time or a caterpillar get out of the cocoon before it's time. You have to wait for it to go through a natural process. So for your listeners, if you're listening, don't pull a caterpillar out of its cocoon. Do you pull it out too early? It'll never fly because it's the struggle within the cocoon that sharpens the wings that allows the butterfly to take flight. So it's a process and it's trust. But for your listeners, I'll, you know, put it to the test like I did. Ask, believe, receive, and perceive. Start to prospect for what you want, and those answers will come. May not be the answers you expect or, you know, big booming voice from the sky, but they will, if you're aware of it, they will make themselves known to you. So fascinating. I, um, you and I know each other from being developing and working mediums, you know, mm -hmm. who both believe in education and are consistently working. That's why yeah. even at this level, we met in development. Yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't realize I actually have my initial training through that Berkeley Psychic Institute vein of teaching as well, which is kind of interesting. And I have a, yeah. a good amount of background in um, massage therapy and training for yeah. sports specific for athletes. So that's kind of fascinating. That is interesting. That we have that in common. And it is yeah. such a different perspective coming from that analytical, you know, making sense of it all. Mm -hmm. What's the, the 
bare bones answer to these things and trying to blend that with a spiritual understanding, which doesn't have <laughs> that always logical linear component to it, but something that resonates so deeply with us that we know it to be true. Even like you said, if we can't see it with the physical eyes, there are things we know to be true. And it's so amazing just looking at the threads in retrospect of how things connect that one mm -hmm. of those things that just happens in life, your professor, you know, needed coverage for their own reasons and then mm -hmm. came in and here was this right teacher at the right time, mm -hmm. perfectly for you that just dropped these little breadcrumbs for you to choose to follow if you, you know, wanted to pick them up. And that's often how I see these progressions is these little breadcrumbs leading us in the way that we need to be led based on what we're available for, or, you know, it, it might at the time have been too big of a leap for you right. to go directly into these communications with your brothers and your, and your father-in-law, like you said, will you talk a little bit about how that started for you? Was it when you first started learning to meditate that all of these things just started happening? Was it after a time of practicing and they came in more slowly? How did that happen for you? Yeah, great question. Yeah, they, they came in pretty quick. I always say when you sit still, the journey begins. You know, think about it from, let's throw a few concepts out there. The mind from sleep study, science, this isn't Mark's theory. This is science, you know, and that's what I love about spiritualism and science is they work, they work together. They're not opposing yeah. forces like different religions are. And I started to look at why the mind is more active asleep than it is awake. And I'm like, why is that? Why is when we sit down and do nothing that the brain starts firing on all these different levels? Now, some would argue that when we go to sleep, that's reality. And when we wake up, this is the dream. But from a science standpoint, it was always fascinating. And so when I started to do meditations, I started to become still. I started to become quiet. And it was through that process that the journey, the soul adventure really started to unfold. And my brothers came through. But like you said, as they came through, now I'm going, oh, my gosh, I'm hearing voices. And in society, if you're hearing voices back then, you were labeled schizophrenic. And I didn't want yeah. people to think I was, you know, being schizophrenic. And then I had people that started asking me questions from a psychic standpoint. And I would be like, I don't know how I know this. I don't know why I know this. And so that's where the intuition comes in. And at that time, I was reading uh, Eckhart Tolle. And he talked about the power of now. And he talked about the greatest uh, agent for change is your awareness. So my awareness, and that's what I'd say to your listeners, start to pay attention to the awareness of not just the physical being, but the emotional, the mental, the material world plays a big impact on us, but also your spiritual journey. And I'm going to go back to you, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. And that's what for me was the big, okay, microscope, telescope, gravity, rainbows. I always ask people, look outside the window and do you see that tree moving? Do you see the wind moving the tree? No, but you see the effects of the wind moving the tree, right? So these are all examples that I really started going, okay, I haven't gone crazy. I'm hearing my brothers. They're talking to me. I'm going to start seeing from an educational standpoint because my mantra is once growth stops, decay begins. doesn't matter if you're just beginning or if you're professional like myself and, and the work you're doing. The learning should always be ongoing. Uh, it's a lifelong process for this this spiritual journey. It doesn't just end like, you know, grade school, high school, college, it's literally the school of life. And so that's how I kind of I started applying these things and learning these different things. And I always try to bring that science aspect into it because at many times, and you know this, Joy, the pseudoscience of this is you can't prove, but you can't disprove some of the stuff we do. When people say, I right. love you, prove it. How do you, how do you, how can you prove your love to somebody, Right. Well, we know that it's an emotion, it's a feeling. And so I really try to, with the work I do today as a teacher and as a student, is to apply, you know, foundations, trust patience, but also the rational aspect of what it is that we do. Absolutely. And I love that you talk about this, I call it like a marinating you mm -hmm. know, journey yeah. of development, where you're seeking out the next teacher that's going to help you fill in the next piece of your development or strengthen you in one area. And then you're finding, you know, the next phase of it. It is mm -hmm. uh, a journey that is, I don't know, it's one of my favorite parts of it that we get to continue to develop because yeah. I just really love learning. When you're saying that you are hearing the voices of your brothers, now it's interesting because you are a medium. So you do, the distinction that I often make for people is, 
someone who's a medium can talk to other people's loved ones, but everyone has the ability to talk to their own loved ones in the spirit world. So were you hearing them more inside, kind of that subjective internal mm -hmm. hearing, or were you mm -hmm. hearing them outside like you hear my voice now? How did that first start coming in for you? Yeah, so the the clairvoyance, the clairaudience, the subject, it was more subjective. It wasn't objective. I wasn't seeing them with my physical eye. That would come later. Yeah. And that, you know, we always ask, I want to see my loved ones. And But when it really happens, and you're like, oh, my gosh, did that really just happen? And then the analytical mind jumps in and starts trying to debunk it. So when I started to first get the communications, again, I started to become still, I started to meditate, I started to quiet the minds, you know, zip this up and start, you know, opening these up a little bit more, start opening this a little bit more. And when, and when that happened, I could hear them, but I didn't understand how is, how is it, was it my imagination? And, and some of your listeners and my students ask me all, all the time, how do we know it's not our imagination versus the, your loved one that's coming through? And I always remind them it's based on time. If if I have time to think about it, then I know my imagination, my left analytical brain is jumping in. But if I hear it and it's pretty instantaneous and I have no reason to think that, that's the voice of my loved ones or my brothers at this point. And so I'm like, I got to find out what's going on. I didn't know what clairvoyance was. I didn't know what clairsentience was. I didn't know what clairaudience was. I didn't have any vocabulary or education. My whole aspect had been in emergency medicine and firefighting up to this point yeah. in my life. And so that's where I started to, you know, I took the Intuition 101 at Berkeley uh, Psychic Institute <laughs> and, and how to deal with intuition. And then it just, you know, it built upon itself. And then, of course, I had teachers and mentors. But again, it's a slow process. It's a steady process. But you always have the free will and choice to, you know, decide if you want to stay on this course. Because there are times that I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this, right? Especially with the people that come to me that are, you know, heavy hearted or full of grief and and but then I realized I can help them. I can speak for their loved ones, hopefully, you know, if I can. And if I can't, then we can, you know, start talking about other things like transformations and healing. And like you said, you don't, I don't personally believe that you have to go to a medium to talk to a loved one. It's beneficial because we've done, we put in the work and we put in the, the frustration and the hair loss um, and the gray, <laughs> you know, the grayness of the beard. But I always ask, I always tell my clients and my students, ask believe receive and perceive put it out there and just give it time it may not happen real time us as humans want it right now right give it some time because we're the only species that measures our life by time no other species does that and energy doesn't have energy doesn't wear a watch and see what they come back it might be a song it might be a movie um it might be i've actually wrote some stuff down um you know, I find I have a stack. You can't see it here, but on my desk, I have a stack of dimes, three stacks of dimes, because my dimes represent my brothers. When I find a dime, it triggers my mind to go, oh, hi, Michael. Hi, Todd. Now, logically, somebody dropped that. But I'll tell you, in some of the places that I found dimes, including I just came from Iceland. I was in Europe. I found an a, a Icelandic. Um, they're like Kronos, Krono, Maybe it was Norway. But I literally found a dime on the street, and it was uh, a, a Euro dime. Right. That's or I'll so be out on cool. a hike and I'll find a hike on a hiking trail. And it's not a quarter. It's not a penny. It's not a nickel. It's a dime. And a uh, prime example. I'll just share this story real, real quick. If we have time. Yeah. Signs, symbols, synergy and synchronistic events. Einstein was quoted as saying synchronicities and coincidences are God's way of remaining anonymous, whatever God is or whoever God is for you. So I get all these synchronicities all the time. And uh, I was just back in uh, my hometown of Spokane. I was at a, a, a a pub that my brother used to frequent so much. He used to frequent it. He used to go read a book and get a picture of beer is after he died, they put a picture of him on the corner. We call it Todd's corner. So I went up there with my friends. We were going to a basketball game and we were sitting there just eating, getting ready for the game. And my niece walks into the bar. My niece did not know this is my brother's second oldest. She didn't know I was in town. She just wow. walked into the bar because she was planning her week out. And she thought she'd have a drink with her dad at the table. And I'm, I walked over and I said, Hannah, do you come here often? And she looked at me and she's like, oh, my God, Uncle Mark. And we hugged and we <laughs> talked and, and, and hung out for about an hour and a half. And then I had to go to the game. And wouldn't you know it, Joy, going into the game, I go through security and I look down and guess what's on the ground? One dime. Now, wow. logically, somebody dropped it, but I picked it up and I looked to the security lady and I go, look, I found a dime. And she's like, that's great, dude. Like, get through security, <laughs> you know, get to the game. But what it was for me was a, it was a confirmation to say, okay, that just whole thing aligned out of all the bars in Spokane. I run into my niece at that one bar 
with no planning and then get a confirmation of a dime on the ground. So for your listeners, repeating numbers, dream visitations, flickering lights, body doubles. Um, I've actually sat down on a bus with a, a young man that looked just like my brother, Michael, so much that I was staring at him on the bus. And he finally said, can I help you with something? Why are you staring? And I said, I'm sorry. You just, it's uncanny how much you look like my little brother. He's like, really? Long story short, he came over and sat next to me on the bus and we had this long conversation that actually was amazing. So those are called body doubles. Um, the coins from heaven, the dimes from heaven, that spirit sense, which is just, you know, a connection to a loved one where, you know, maybe you're driving and they pop into your head or maybe you smell a, a, a fragrance uh, like your grandma's favorite perfume or your uh, your your granddad's pipe. Um, there's all sorts of signs, symbols, synergy and synchronistic events if you're aware of them. If you're not, then the magic doesn't happen. That's why I talk about the magic in the moment. And when you become present, take a pause, take a breath, quiet the chatter in the mind. And you ask, believe, receive, and perceive. You can get a message from your loved one, and you don't need a, a medium to do that, in my personal opinion. For sure. I You don't know this, but I actually offer a free three-day science mini course on my website, joyfulmedium.com. And I nice. teach how to get signs through numbers, how to get signs from the universe, and how to get specific signs, just like you're talking about, from your loved ones in the spirit world. And mm -hmm. it really is. I love that you shared that story because... It never ceases to amaze me the unusual ways that these, you know, symbols, yours is dimes, that can come across your path. I was just joking with someone yesterday. Uh, I do with someone that leaves me dimes too, oddly. And I never have coins. Who has coins anymore, really, anyway? Right. It's and all plastic. I, uh, yeah, I found a dime inside my dryer that I just, mm -hmm. I don't know where in the world this could have possibly come from. So, yeah, you'll... Yes, of course, in the grand scheme of things, you know, you're walking through a turnstile. Someone at some point clearly dropped a dime there, but spirit is orchestrating you to be in that exact line. You didn't go in a different line. You went in that line. Right. It is orchestrating to get your attention, you know, in some way for you to look down at that moment. You could have been looking up and not, you know, there's so many elements that go into it mm -hmm. for those signs to really be specific and significant from our loved ones. So I love that you shared that story. And if you go deeper with that, that is a form of communication, right? Because yeah, how do you, absolutely. how do you, how do you talk to somebody that no longer has a vibration or a vocal cord? How do you communicate with somebody? And I ask people that all the time. They're like, well, I don't really know. Awareness becoming present to you, uh, you know, paying attention to those signs, those symbols, those synergy. And what I mean by synergy, synergy is the same energy that's in your heart that makes your heart go. Without the energy in your heart, there's no heartbeat. With no heartbeat, there's no breath. So, you know, when I was getting my certifications in emergency medicine, I'd always ask my teachers, my instructors, where does that energy come from? What is the energy that makes the heart beat, that makes it pulsate? Where does that come from? Because energy has to come from somewhere, right? Laws of right. physics state that energy doesn't just cease to exist. It always has to go from the light bulb to the source and the source back to the light bulb. So I'd ask all my instructors who were very educated and they'd say, well, we really just don't know. It's kind of like when you take, um, when you go into surgery and they give you some of that feel good stuff that knocks you out. Um, we don't know how it works. We just know how much to give you. So you don't feel the pain and, but we don't know where that energy comes from. So some people call it the divine spark, the divinity within. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I do a lot of different readings with religions around the world from um, mm -hmm. Judaism to Hinduism, to uh, Catholicism, to Christianity. And a lot of references are made, even, uh, you know, Jesus talked about the divinity within. And I believe they were talking about that energy that makes our heart go. So, you know, that energy that makes the heart go is the same energy that when this heart stops has to go somewhere. Right. And so I, I remind people of that, that everything is energy. And when you become aware of a much bigger world and you take these glasses off, you know, the rose colored glasses and this eye starts to open up, you'll start to see many things that you didn't expect. And those coincidences and synchronicities become quite frequent to where you just laugh. And you're now having a communication, frequent communication yeah. with your loved ones, with your fur baby, your fur babies will do this as well. Oh, I talk about sure. people. Sometimes yep. I have readings where people want to talk more to their animals 
than their loved ones in in the real, you know, in the uh, theric well, world. Well, they're souls with a personality and <laughs> yeah. important parts of our families. And so I say pay attention because, you know, the animals don't talk like we talk. They talk in a different way, but they'll express themselves and they're still empathetic and they may move the dog dish or you may feel like their presence jumping up on the bed and you're like, but there's nothing there, but I know that I felt them. So these are all forms of higher communications. And in fact, science would say that how you and I are communicating right now, Joy, through these uh, these you know outlets and this vibration is actually a very um, how do I want to say this? A very non intelligent way of communicating. We think we're intelligent as humans because we can communicate and read and write, but actually, as we progress and evolve, a lot of theories talk about you know artificial intelligence, how we're starting to talk. Mm -hmm. Think about how our communications have changed over the time I've been on the planet. We've gone from the handheld. Uh, phone that was mounted on the wall with a big yeah. long cord to I can have a little black box and talk to anybody around the world without any cords without so imagine with the next 50 years of technology and we don't we don't talk like this anymore we talk like this we talk through our thumbs right. if you think about it so we're evolving yeah. because you don't get from point a to point b you don't go from the caterpillar to the butterfly without the cocoon phase and this is one form of, of communication that it's going through a cocoon phase so in the next 50 years I personally believe there'll be technology that will allow us to communicate um, with our loved ones in some way or some form or some fashion, because people don't realize the phone wasn't created to talk with the living. The phone was created to talk with the dead. I'll say more about that. I well, know what you're you, talking about. But yeah. So if you go, that. if you go back to <laughs> one person that's just fascinating me through history is um, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla is known as the father of frequency. And back, if we go all the way back to 1865, which would be at the height of spiritualism as well, 1849 is when spiritualism, modern day spiritualism, communicating with the Fox sisters, you know, a, a, a two-way communication is what I'm trying, an intelligent two-way communication. Mm -hmm. In 1865, um, Tesla talked about that there would be a little black box that you could talk to people through frequency, vibration, and energy with anybody around the world. And at that time, yeah. people called him a witch. They called him a warlock. And what is this? A little black box, you know, hundreds, yeah. 150 years later that you can talk to people. So he was vision. He was visionary, but he was also probably clear, um, clear cognizant, just knowing that this was going to, uh, you know, that psychic, you know, future, if you will, but the future is right. never set, right? Because the best part about the future is it comes one day at a time. Abraham Lincoln reminds us of that. And you know, as a psychic, we get all sorts of questions. When I'm going to die, what are the winning lottery numbers? Spirit world could care less about winning yeah. lottery numbers and, and money, right? So yeah, technology is going to be an interesting part of the spiritual journey for those that are just maybe starting their spiritual journey and listening to this show. Technology is going to play a big part of your abilities as well. Um, you know, I've been hooked up at the college and, you know, seen different brain wavelengths between meditation and prayer, big difference between sleep, prayer and meditation. The brain actually does right. different things. So yeah. it's, it's quite interesting. I, I love what I do now, but 20 years ago, I, you know, I would have been like, I don't even know any of this <laughs> stuff. So it is really fascinating now that, you know, with the advancements of technology, we're also able to measure, like you're saying, things like mediumship and meditation and, mm -hmm. uh, our brain waves when we're learning versus when we're speaking versus when we're communicating with the other side. So it really is all so fascinating. If nothing else, at a very basic level, I feel like the, how you were saying, you know, we can communicate over sound waves and radio waves. And mm -hmm. I do feel like it, it does help in lending itself to understand how, well, if someone is part of that non-physical world, right, they don't have a physical body, they've crossed over it then lends itself to make sense that yes, they can more easily move their energy with sound waves to, you know, make a TV, make a noise that it doesn't normally make or mm -hmm. speak through a sound box or make a light flicker because light waves are less dense than our human form. And since mm -hmm. they're less dense now, it makes sense that they can manipulate the energy in that way. I'm excited to see the future of these spirit boxes, quote unquote, these communication devices for the spirit world. So we'll see yeah. what happens. And we played around with some of the technology. Now, I want to go back to it's not just let's just don't base it on the technology. Right. Remember, course, yeah. you are the equipment. So a big part of this journey is how you develop. So for your listeners out there, how you develop, how you develop your clairs, your clairvoyance, your clairsentience, which are usually the two first clairs, because we all would agree. Science would agree that we have our five physical senses. See it, taste it, touch it, hear it and smell it. But once you start to awaken, once you start that third eye starts to get the sleep rubbed out of its eye and you're opening your third eye or you're awakening, 
we start to add the other sensories of clairvoyance and clairsentience and claircognance and uh, clairfactory and clair, you know, hearing, clair audio, clairgustance, which is taste. And when you start to develop those abilities, remember that, you know, I remember John Holland told me way back when I first started, you are the equipment. So you have right. to develop yeah. your equipment. The technology will always be there. The platforms and outlets will always be there in the future, but you are the equipment. And you got to not just, you know, develop your, yourself as the equipment, but you got to take care of yourself as the equipment. We don't talk about the health of the work as you and I do. We've got to be able to, you know, if your, phone, if your phone's, you know, constantly going, sometimes you need to unplug it and put it down and turn it off or plug it in to recharge. We're, we're no different. When you're working with energy, um, when you're working with frequency and you're working with grief and death and dying, we have to take times, I always say, take the time to disconnect so you can have the time to reconnect. And that's very important for the health of this because it's your adrenals, it's your nervous system. We could spend a whole other episode on just the health of the medium and things and discussions oh, sure. and debates yeah. we've had. But that's important too. You are the equipment. So take care of yourself and keep up with the technologies because they said artificial intelligence is going to be much bigger than fire and electricity. And if you think how fire and electricity has changed our evolution as a species, I'm thinking, well, artificial intelligence is going to be interesting. And what's that going to encompass? Is that going to encompass not just the living, but is that going to also encompass what's not seen, like the microscope did and what the telescope did? I think absolutely some of the ways we can start to see and some of the ways we haven't even yet begun to understand. So, and I love that you're talking about our own instrument ourselves, our physical mm -hmm. body, our auric field, which is a part of the emanation of our soul and exactly. using that to be more sensitive. I actually, my, my personal philosophy it developed on all the teachings of all my teachers really mm -hmm. is I feel like these, the more of the psychic senses, the clairs, all of that, I feel like those are our first senses before mm -hmm. we're even able to see much outside of our body or to mm -hmm discern ourselves, you know, our physical beings from our parent that's holding us or so it, it is so fascinating, the navigation of that. And, and it, it will be interesting, something I, I would love to have a conversation on next, the next time we meet is just this idea of as we become more and more dependent on technology, without the intentional concentration and effort on keeping our machines, our physical selves sensitized what does that look like? Is there going to be in people that maybe are not expressing their mediumship or their sensitivities or are not taught to meditate? Are they going to lose some of that ability to be sensitive because they're not training it and they're behind a screen? You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Not using it. What is that going to look like? How are people who are probably coming into their spiritual gifts right now or right mm -hmm. on the cusp of it might be the people developing new ways for us to you know, grow and stay present and still be a part of this technological world. And uh, it's a really, it's, it's, there's so much to talk about in all of that. Yeah. And it's, you know, and we can talk about it too. That's a, that's a big, I think that's a big paradigm shift because if, even if you go back to our, our parents' generation, they didn't talk about, I, I think every day, especially this generation behind us, they're more open, they're more awake, they're more in tune, not just from, the material world, but for the planet, from nature, from uh, sustainability. And we have the ability to talk about it, like what you and I are doing today, be, to be able to put this out, to put this this message out, this vibration that anybody can go listen to and say, okay, we can talk about this openly without the fear of, you know, prosecution or, you know, right. being, you know, burned at the stake. I mean, we're, st we're still going to have our critics and our, you know, uh, uh, pundits course, yeah. that are going to, you know, have, you know, skepticism and judgment and opinion. Of course, that will never change. That's just human nature. But we have the ability to teach on it, to speak openly about it without the fear of, you know, some sort of, you know, retribution of somebody coming at us to you know, take our lifestyle away. Right. So I think that's important, too, because that's just changed within the last 50 years that I've been on the planet. And it comes back to I think movies have had a big impact on society and the messages that movies can bring and resonate with, you know, culture, uh, music. Um, even the social media platforms, I'm not a big fan of the social media platforms because I think they, they can have a place for good, but they also cause a lot of pain and misinformation and disinformation and divide, which we don't want. But one of my psychic predictions has been the Roaring Twenties will be the great coming together. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it's a, you know, a natural event, if it's a, you know, little green men from outer space that, you know, gets the world to think differently, but we have this concept of this great coming together and it's going to be incorporated with technology and working through our technology as a species. And, um, 
because the technology is not stopping. The technology is right. actually getting progressively yeah. more advanced as we're as we're sitting here today. And so for you know the younger generation, embrace that sensitivity, embrace those abilities. Uh, you know, if you don't know something, go find a teacher and learn from them. Somebody that's you know a little, maybe a little bit older has gone through some of these, you know, ups and downs or the soul adventures because they can relate to you and share with you. But yeah, it's going to be an interesting, the Roaring Twenties, uh, like I, you know, I did this prediction back in 2019, the Roaring Twenties are going to be quite transformative for our culture, for our species, uh, and what we're going through from a technology standpoint. The three biggest secrets, Antarctica, the ocean, and space. Those are going to be three transformative things that are going to happen in our Roaring Twenties that will get people thinking much more differently than they are now. Well, that's exciting. I'm excited to talk about that. We'll have to, we'll have to have a follow-up episode in the new year. Um, for anyone who is wanting to learn more about you, I know that they can check out marklanehart.com or search Mark Lanehart, the intuitive prospector. And you also have a radio show where you talk about all of these topics. Where can they find that? Yeah. So I always tell people the best way to find me to do a little of your own prospecting is just type in the intuitive prospector or my name, Mark Lane Hart. I promise you I will pop up somewhere, somehow. Uh, the podcast is called Inspired Living and we're now a top rated podcast, top uh, 100 inspirational podcast to follow and listen to in 2023. And uh, But the best place is marklanehart.com. That's probably the best place to go to get in contact with me or you know get on the newsletter or article or show or whatnot. So and of course, I'll have links to your website and all the things in the show notes. Are you up for a quick four question spirit speed round? Let's do it. Speed round. Right. You, you, like, speed you, you round. have some music that you can cue, like a ding, ding, ding. You need like a bell that's going to come in when you say that. <laughs> the ding speed round. We could. Here, here we go. Uh, we'll here we go. I got, I got you. I got you. So say that again okay. and I'll cue it. Ready? Go. Okay. Spirit speed round. Ooh. There you go. I like it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, share one thing that's really shocked you or was unexpected about your spiritual gifts, your mediumship. The inner transformation and healing that came from that, the growth, the evolution, uh, again, witnessing the caterpillar into the butterfly. For yourself personally, you mean? For myself personally, yeah. Wow. That's, that's a profound answer. Uh, okay. If you got to spend... A 24 hour day in the spirit world. You got the full tour. Again, it sounds like you got to spend time with everyone who you've ever known who's on the other side. And it's almost time to return to your life here. And your guide tells you you have one earth hour left and you can spend it with anyone who's on the other side. Who do you choose and why? It's a great question. There's so many people that you could pick from. I think for me, if that scenario was to present itself, I'd want to talk with my future self, my older self, my wiser self Interesting. to give me perspective, not the, the, the free will and choices that we all have to make, but to kind of help me with the duality of my physical self and my spiritual ev evolution of what this has gone through. So I'd spend an hour talking to my older, wiser self to help me with my current self. Wow. I love that answer. All right. <laughs> Even though we have these spiritual gifts, we have very human lives. Sure. What's one quirky thing about you that people might be surprised to learn? Oh my God. There's like a whole list. Uh, <laughs> I've got For lots of quirks. Of I know. I'm actually quite a big geek. If you didn't, if the star Wars and little green Yoda Grogu didn't give that away. I'm, I'm a geek at heart. I'm a child at heart. Um, I love to go to, Disney World, if you want to see a grown man acting like a, a, a child, um, I'm a prime example. I'm pretty quirky that way. I love to just carp diem and live. I love it. That's great. Okay, leave us with one pearl of wisdom. What's one piece of advice that you wish you had had early on in your understanding of your gifts? Hmm. I'm actually going to go back to a quote, actually, uh, for that, and it's from Deepak Chopra, and he talked about how everyday life surrounds us in a swirling chaos, and it's easy to fall into the grip of our ego's fears and confusion. Remind yourself each day of your intentions and your spiritual purpose. Meditate, find your center, look closely at yourself, and don't let go of your intention until it feels centered inside yourself. And he also talked about that every great change is preceded by chaos. And I think that chaos that was preceded 
has led me to this path. So one day at a time and really find the magic in the moment. The power of now is so important, not the past. You can't change in a future that's not guaranteed. So the magic of now. Wow, that is really profound advice. Thank you so much for being here with us You're today. Welcome. I loved talking with you. I hope that we will get to have a another session in the future and dive into all of the other <laughs> things well, that we could talk about. Let's carry the chat over on Inspired Living in 2023 and we can uh, have another uh, topic of, and then this time I'll be the host and you can be the guest and you can, and we can have another, uh, what did you call it? This, this last thing you just did? The spirit speed round. You can put me on the spot with some there you speed go. round questions. Oh, I love it. Well, thank you so much thank for you. being here on the Spirit Speaking Speed. Thank you. I appreciate you. A big thank you for that open and honest conversation with Mark Lanehart. Again, you know you can find his website in the show notes. His name is spelled a little differently than you might think, so make sure you get that link. Again, we mentioned the free three-day signs course, sign magnet that I have on the joyfulmedium.com website. Just go to joyfulmedium.com and right on that homepage, you can sign up totally free and learn how to get signs from the universe, but also signs from your own loved ones in the spirit world. I love the story that Mark shares with us about the dimes. And I'm always talking about how signs can come to us in just the most specific and sometimes unusual ways. So he gives some really great examples. I love that he's willing to talk to us about that and about energy and really stretches into some broad topics of the future of what all of this work might look like. We will definitely be having another talk with him in 2023 to explore his predictions for how this energy and this work, this you know, spiritual connection, mediumship, our communication with loved ones in the spirit world, how he perceives that that all might be moving in a different direction in the future. So I'm really excited to continue this conversation with him uh, going forward. But I really hope that you enjoyed all of the sharing about his own personal experiences with grief and grieving and his own losses and his own near-death experiences. And I'm hoping that something in there resonated with you, with your own personal experiences, or even questions that you've been wondering about. I'm so grateful to him for sharing with us so generously of his really personal and um, private experiences. So I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. There are many, many more to come. Thanks for being with me today inside the Spirit Speakeasy. Big hugs. Bye for now. And oh yeah, don't forget, if you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to like, to give us five stars, to share, and to subscribe so we can keep spending this time together inside the Spirit Speakeasy.